All right, everybody, how's it going? Jamie Monroe here. Um, I'm doing this backyard curriculum webinar um, because I work with a bunch of athletes, my JM3 athletes, and I really did this for them, but I'm sharing with all of you uh, because um, it's information that everybody should have. If you want to kind of know what we do and how we do it, this is how I go about stuff. Um, I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to kind of get into this presentation for a second, but just to give you a little background, the backyard curriculum was, was born in COVID lockdown. It was me and my three kids, uh, lot and, and my wife, but she, she didn't, she played a little bit, she played a little bit of goalie, but for the most part, it was the four of us playing lacrosse in the backyard once a day at noon, every day we would go out and do something. We usually played hoops and then we played some lacrosse. Um, and, um, we started making up games to play. Um, and at that time I've, I've been on this, um, free play journey of learning different environments to create. And so we started doing this. And, and then what I started to do was I started to teach my JM3 athletes that were, they were also home in lockdown, you know, and some people had no brothers and sisters. And they, and honestly, like I had this one girl I work with that she did, she did area one-on-ones against her mom, but you know what? It was good in my, in, 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 in this, uh, so one boy did area one of ones against his mom too. Um, but then some people had, you know, mom and net. We had a lot of good moms and net. I'll tell you that. Um, it was pretty cool. But, but long story short, the progress that people made in the backyard, in these small environments was astounding. So then lockdown's over and everyone's back to their normal um, schedules, which are just incredibly busy. And so... I want to bring this back and I'm doing it with my JM3 athletes committed to it. And this webinar is going to explain kind of how we go about doing stuff. So thanks for coming on board. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and um, we'll, we'll get it going. All right, let's do it. First of all, from 50,000 feet, let's just go big picture here. Why are we doing what we're doing? How do human beings operate? The way we operate is we perceive our surroundings and we act, okay? It doesn't matter whether you're at a party, whether you're driving, whether you're at school, or whether you're playing sports, this is how we operate. We perceive our surroundings and we act. We make a decision to act. The perception action coupling is what this is called. And this is the roots of what we need to practice and what we need to teach and what we need to focus on. Because skill equals technique plus decision. And so therefore, everything we do, we want to have this combination and you cannot extract the technique away from the situation or the decision. In every situation, you are being provided opportunities that are called affordances. And your ability to recognize those affordances and take advantage of them is the entire key. Rather than trying to pick the skills that you would like everybody to know, pick the situations that they're gonna be in and the skills will emerge from the situations. And if skills, are, that you wanted or hoped would emerge do not emerge. It's because of the situation, not because of the athlete. This, these skills will emerge if the task requires them to. The concept of repetition without repetition, there are certain things that happen over and over again, like in two-man game, they either switch or stay. And if they stay, they go over or under. So there are things that are repetitive but they're slightly different every single time. And that's how we want to practice. That's how it happens in a game. Doing 50 of those and 50 of these and 50 of these is not how it happens. And practicing in that way feels good because it seems like you're accomplishing a lot, but it's not realistic. Fundamentals is a fundamentally misunderstood word, in my opinion. I don't think what most people feel like a fundamental is, is a, a particular technique like overhand or two hands ground balls or changing planes on shots, you name it. There's a, there's a lot of them. 
but I don't believe that that's what fundamentals are. I think fundamentals, I would define it as concepts in the game. Fundamentals are communication, deception, seeing the field, reading the play. These are the fundamentals that are critical in perception action coupling. It is impossible to communicate if you can't perceive what's happening. That's why like, you know, when you're sort of like, um, you know, you, you, you think of the comeback like the next day because you just couldn't think of it at the time that you just didn't have the ability to perceive the situation and act on that joke at the right moment in time. It happens in all walks of life. It's why when our kids are like, oh, but dad, I'm a good driver. No, you're not a good driver just because you know how to turn the wheels and stay in the lines and step on the brakes and the gas pedal. It's about decision making. It's about perception, action, coupling. And so what we want to try to do is focus on these fundamentals that are concepts in the situations that we're going to create. And free play, such a huge part of it. You guys got to listen to this, um, the Huberman Lab podcast. This guy, Andrew Huberman, Stanford professor, um, has an amazing podcast where he talks about free play and he describes it as a homeostatically regulated part of the human condition, almost statically regulated. That means it's, it, it's like eating and sleeping. Like if you don't have enough food, you eat. If you haven't slept, you need to sleep. Children need play. Um, the other thing about play, though, is if at low stakes, low stakes meaning not too much pressure, you can't have adrenaline flowing for play to do these things, but play is actually one of the best ways to create neuroplasticity that exists. It might be the best way, according to Andrew Huberman. Neuroplasticity is what carves out new pathways in the brain and allows you to explore contingencies. You see that the theme here? This is what we're, was what we're shooting for and everything we're trying to do. And of course, box across, I always talk about this. This is why I was showing the video before. Box across is kind of the ultimate environment, in my opinion, to learn how to be a great lacrosse player because the small nets force you to get to the middle. And it's easier to get to the middle without the ball than with the ball. And you can't just clear space and run by people and spread out and long dodge. So you got to bring people together to create space. That's two man game. And it's easier to do off ball than on ball. And it becomes a more of a passing and picking and, and cutting game than a pure dodging game. Although the dodging is there, it's critical because every time there's a two man game, there is a dodge. So anyways, the free play style that we tend to play is essentially box lacrosse. Okay, so what I'm sort of sharing with you guys here are four environments back to the original slide, four key environments that I think that if you focus on, you can become world-class in your backyard with your, with your mom and your dad and your brother and your sister and your friends. Um, and, um, you know, if you're, co if you're a coach, you can definitely do this with your teams. And I highly recommend that you do. But I try to keep these drills, these four simple and small enough that you could actually accomplish them without big numbers, okay? All right, so let's talk about dodging. Dodging, I think, is kind of misunderstood too because when people talk about dodging, they talk about running by people. And, and you think about like dodging like with speed and you think about running by people and long dodges. But really, dodging is your ability to control your defender. I want you to think about dodging more like a basketball player who can – Use step backs to create space or to draw his defender to him or jabs to shift their weight and get them off balance. You need to be able to initiate contact and turn the corner and lean in because you might want to pop back out. You need to know how to use hesitation moves. You also need to learn how to bounce out and redodge. You need how to post up. And, and use hostage dribbles. Now, I didn't put in, if you notice, there's one missing sort of part of the repertoire in here, and that's rollbacks and cutbacks. And I only didn't do that because the, the one, the dodging drill we're going to use doesn't emphasize that. Although I do think that rollbacks and cutbacks can be an absolutely critical part of your dodging. However, you're going to see when we show you this drill. 
um, kind of what I'm talking about. But first, let, let's take a look at at this movie I, 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 I had I put together. This is Stephen Rafis dodging using hesitation moves galore. Watch how his initial move doesn't create much of a separation, but his hezies create really big separation, setting up a simple rollback. He makes dodging look so easy, this guy Rafis. Bounce out, turn the corner, hezzy, go. That, that was like actually a fake swim move right there. Watch this. <laughs> he doesn't stick the shot, but watching this guy move is, is sort of, I, I'm just pointing this out to everybody because he is dodging in a way that I think most players should really think about dodging. Stop, go, pop, looking to feed looking to score, reading the defense, not allowing the defense to slide, using deceptiveness with his posture, and of course, all of those hesitations, cutting his man off, bouncing out, hezzy, go, swim, sell, go, roll back, hezzy, hezzy, and then a little post-up move with a rocker move. Again, probably should have buried it. Now, I'm showing you all this because when I do Zoom calls with JM3 athletes, these are the things I'm always talking about. I'm talking about, you really got to try to use more hesitation moves. What most people do is they just roll back, roll back, roll back. The hesitation moves are so much harder to guard than the straight up roll back cutback, which is what most people do all the time. Look at the creativity on this. I was actually at this game. Georgetown had a big win. Um, but Stephen Rafis, incredibly talented player and really fun to watch with all the repertoire of things that he does. And again, I'm showing you this as a little bit of a precursor to the kind of dodging, like how do you teach this stuff? How do you practice this stuff? This is really cool little nuanced dodge here. I want you to notice the way he comes out of dodges and immediately hesitates. That is very counterintuitive. And he also uses this little step away to bring his guy to him. But why is it counterintuitive to Hezzy coming out of your move? Because it seems like they're going to catch up to you. But that's just it. They will. You're letting them catch up, but you're actually let, letting them catch up by putting on the brakes. You're making them put on the brakes more than you put on the brakes. All right. I'm going to show you one more really cool clip of Jeff Teat from 2020. One of the last games that was played right before the uh, pandemic hit. Huge win for Cornell, and he gets the shorty. Watch how he kind of carries it over, splits, leans in, steps back, splits again. Inside roll, backhand pump, step back, swim. I mean, the amount of moves that he does here in a short period of time, in a little space, was pretty amazing. Well, let's watch it one more time. So he splits, leans in, steps away, opens up so he can face dodge again, rolls back, steps, oh, sorry, spins, backhand pumps, steps back like he's going to shoot. I love that step back. Swims, rolls right back and shoots it. All right, so how are you going to teach this stuff? So there's a drill that's called area 1v1s. It is one of the best drills. And I did make this up with my family in quarantine in which you will learn and be able to practice every move you can think of. Well, and let's just count them. Let's just take a look at this for a sec. How many moves? Step back, but the defense overplayed it. Rocker, another step back, split, a hezzy, a cutoff, lean in, jab, rocker, Another hezzy, step back, another step back, split, hezzy, hezzy, cut off. Why is this drill so great? Because if you do drills to the net, if you just go to the net, what ends up happening is you make one move and you score. But here, look at how many dodges we're getting. One, two, three, four, five. Six on the cutoff, seven on the step back, eight on the jab, nine on the hezzy, 10 on the hezzy, 11, uh, 12, 11 on, the, on the cutoff, 12 on the step back, 13 on the next step back, 14 on the split, 15 on the rocker, 16 on the hezzy, 17. That's 17 dodges in like 20, 19 seconds. What are area 1v1s? Area 1v1s are dodges 
1v1, where the defense must pressure, keeping no less than an arm's length to the Dodger. And starting in a post-up, the Dodger must create separation with a step back move. And then the offense must try to get a step on their man and get back to the line. I'll explain what that means in a second. Getting back to the line is cutting off your man. It's leaning in. It's sealing them. It's hostage dribble. And when you've done that once, you you the play the 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 one on one continues for three reps of this. So let's let's go back and take a look at what I mean by dodging back to the line. Oops, sorry. Try that one more time. All right, so I'm going to draw here. The imaginary line through the feet of the defender is the line I'm talking about. Whenever you square up, you're going to have to dodge your man and try to get back to that line. And the defender is going to try not to let you get back to that line. But remember, the defender has to pressure you. So if you're having a hard time beating your man, you can always step back and learn how to bring your man to you, which is, of course, an advantage because you can create an approach. If the defender jams you up on your move, you can hezzy to try to get back to the line. If you're getting really jammed up, you could bounce out to get back to the line. And now you're going to kind of see why we don't really roll back so much in this particular drill, because if you rolled back, you'd get back to the line, but your man would still be on the side of you. I want you to understand that if you draw this line and you get and you beat your man and get back to the line, your goal is to try to cut them off and actually keep them and seal them off on the wrong side of you on the lawn on that line. That is what we're trying to do in, in area one v ones. Let's watch another rep. Step back. Pretty good little jab hesitation. Jab. Step back, punch. So this, this dodging drill can be done with full equipment. It can be done with no equipment. Um, it can be done. I've, I've, I do it with boys with full equipment. I, I actually really love it with, with no equipment. When I did it with my three kids, I, we, had, we had my son and, and two daughters. They had to go against each other. All right, so how are we going to get a step? The step back is the easiest way. If you can step back and bring your man to you, you're going to be able to get a step even when it's to, where you're being overmatched. It's so important that you understand how to do that. That's why you got to be able to stick your body in there. That's why we start in a post up. These jabs, you guys, jabs are so important. You can't really jab going too fast. Now you kind of can, you can split and jab people up with a split dodge, your traditional sort of, you know, running at your guy. But these jabs are a little different. These are more like basketball jabs that shift the, shift the person's weight. We got these moves called punch moves, and we use hesitation moves and redodges to get our step. Jeff T is such a master at getting a step, and he's jabbing by looking right and going left as he refuses a pick. You got the legs go earlier Josh this Byrne. What a freak he is. The way he comes in slowly, sorry guys. The legs go early. The way he comes in slowly and is able to jab right, pause, go right, and shoot a screenshot. Let's watch this again. This is very similar. Now, this defender is not pressuring, but this is very similar to the type of jab moves that we were seeing. Look at where his stick is, guys. Watch how. He uses his stick to jab across his body low. This jab will allow that defender, if the defender doesn't step over, then Burns already by him. But it's a double move, too, because he's jabbing right and leaning left at the same time, and it shifts the defender's weight. Nakai Montgomery did this all the time. If you watch the way this guy dodged, he would come very slowly at his guy. Got this dodging film of him from a while back. 
where he'd like get slow, close to you and slow down. Slowing down is key in dodging at times. Nothing wrong with running fast at your guy, but why? Nikai Montgomery is one of the fastest guys out there. But, but if you notice, he always slowed down and he dodged more like a basketball player than he did your typical lacrosse player. And it allowed him to have more time for decision-making. Box, box, players, box players always dodge this way. Check out this little step back. Body's in, steps back, draws the check and he's able to step by it. I actually really figured this, um, these jab hesitations out from, from basketball. You know, when you watch basketball, particularly pro basketball, and you see somebody like Kobe go by his man, and you're like, how did that guy play such bad defense? And it's, it's because what these guys are able to do is shift the defender's weight. So by jabbing right there and then pausing, he got that defender to shift his weight onto his left foot with his initial jab. And then, and then with the pause and the lean back, it shift, his, the guy's weight shifted to his right foot. And while Kobe was going, his feet are rooted in the ground called a jab hesitation. It's what Josh Byrne did a second ago. Jab, pause, and go. It's deadly. The, the step back that I've been talking about, you know, look, I like this a lot better than a question mark move, to be honest with you, because question marks, you lose all your angles, aren't you? Um, the question marks, you lose all your angle. In this particular move, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're stepping back. This is the same step back we're working on in our area 1v1s. It's just that he happens to have a cage that he can that he can use. It's, it's also the same move that Jeff T used to set up his swim move that ended up scoring the goal in, in overtime to beat Penn State. Behind the cage, this is something. The dodge, bounce, re-dodge. The bounce out gives you new angles. It's also a hesitation. So by bouncing away, he brought his guy out to him. You see how he came out to him a little bit? And with a hesitation, he missed. And he was done. How do you work on this? How do you teach it? So area 1v1s, guys, in my opinion, is the best way to learn how to do this. Check out that jab hesitation right there. Watch this. Watch the defender's feet. You see him? What she did was she jabbed subtly and then split and the defender was still reacting to that initial jab fake when she after the split was going on learning how to hold your stick and jab in different directions here the jab forces the defender to jump over you see that watch this jab right there the defender jumps over hezzy's galore so getting back to the line, you guys, this is getting back to the line literally happens on every single dodge. And it's the probably the biggest problem that people have with their dodging is they don't initiate contact on their man. And if you don't initiate contact on your man, your man's going to initiate contact on you. They're going to push you off track and you're going to not have the shot out of the angle that you want. And you're going to run into defenders, the help defenders, the adjacent defenders. You have to make first contact. You have to turn the corner. You have to lean in. I, I, I really, when I talk about physical dodging, I, I do put initiating contact, leaning in, turning the corner, hostage dribble. I put those all in the same bucket because it's never exactly the same. But what I mean by this is if you're so much faster than your men that you can just turn the corner on them and just S dodge them, it accomplished the same thing as leaning in on them because it's, it's retaining your angle. So I just kind of put it in the bucket of, Hey, you're getting back to the line. It's like physical dodging. Sometimes you got to initiate that contact and lean in them. Hostage dribbles when you get them on your back. I got a cool clip on that. And then the hesitations are so key because a lot of times, Hey, listen, when you get a step on your man. So when you start a dodge, your man's in front of you. 
When you get a step on your man, he's on the side of you. But that doesn't mean you have him. And that's where most people roll back. And that's kind of why I left it, even though I love rollback. That's why I left it off that, that, that list. And it's not really in this drill. Because too many people roll back, roll back, roll back, roll back, roll back. And they don't go anywhere. They're rolling right back into a defender that's waiting for them. Remember, if they're on the side of you, you've got the step. Now you have to like continue and turn that corner and a hesitation will do it. Think about this. If you put on the brakes and fake a rollback, your man will put on the brakes after you and more than you. So it's the concept of getting a step on your man by making him stop more than you and also stop while you're going. That's why on the first clip that I showed you with Stephen Rathis, he was getting incredible steps, bigger steps on his hezzies than he was on his actual move. And the bounce out, same thing. It helps you get back to the line. But let's um, let's take a let's take a listen to this. There are many other names for the hostage duel, such as a cob, a piggyback, keeping the defender in jail. But Luca undoubtedly is one of the best players in the NBA at using this technique. When coming off the ball screen, the benefit of the hostage dribble is it gives Luca more time to make his decision, whether that's finishing at the rim or passing to the roll man. More of that will be covered in part two when we look at the role of the screener and beating the drop coverage. All right. So that was uh thank you to Alex Sarama, basketball immersion. I've uh, become friends with Alex over the last several months. One of the most brilliant guys I've ever met. And he did this really cool thing on hostage dribble from Luka Doncic. And in basketball, we see it all the time. But in lacrosse, you got to be able to do this. you got to be able to cut your guy off, to buy time, to draw slides, to, to isolate two-on-ones, um, and to just and mostly to buy time for decision-making, just, just as uh, Luke, Alex was saying. Sowers up top. Look at it. So here Sowers does it with, with speed. He leans right in. And he puts this guy on his back, and it, and it really created the two-on-one that allowed him to hit the fade. For it. Jeff Teat uses hostage dribble all the time. Watch how he makes his move, and then he cuts his guy off and keeps him on his back. Airy 1v1s from yesterday. Some not oh, check out that little jab hesitation, though, you guys. Check this out. Watch this. Watch the jab hesitation right here. That's a good step. Now, I want the defender in this drill, though. The defender needs to keep pressuring. Okay. The defender needs to keep pressuring here because I want, I want, I want the uh dodger here to, to be able to hostage dribble. But here it comes, keeps coming, putting pressure on. There it is. Pretty good opportunity. He could have probably hostage dribbled him a little bit more here. I would have liked to him to slow down right there to work on this, but to be able to get this space. Now check out this little jab. That's kind of like the Josh Byrne jab hesitation with a toe drag. Jab, pause, go. And then there's the hezzy right there that got him into his position. This is so key, you guys. He's he's. A lot of people will just roll back here, but you got to hezzy and keep going. You will get your guy to stop more than you. Grant Amet showing a great, a great couple examples of the way he uses. He, he has a little step here, but his hezzy gives him a much bigger step. And now he gets the guy on his back and he goes with the hostage dribble concept. All right. I am going to stop for a second here and see if we have questions uh, before I get into the next environment. Um, let's see. Any other any questions from anybody here? This looks like we don't really have any at this time. If you have a question, go ahead and ping me right now, and I'd be happy to answer it. Um, but man, I, I I can't I can't stress enough the importance of area one v ones. And and you know, look, I generally don't love one-on-ones to the net because I feel like there's not enough context to make it worthwhile. It's too easy for the offense 
just to run full speed and get us and run by their guy and make one or two moves and that's it. And obviously it's a little harder against the pole, but still it's just unrealistic. You know, you know, if you're a defenseman out there, it's just annoying when the guy like circles all the way 10 yards across the top and then turns the corner and turns a righty wing dodge into a righty alley. Dodge. But these area one V ones, because of the constraints and the tasks in them, they elicit a feel for dodging that is uncommon. You just don't see people doing this that much. All right, here's a couple of questions. Everyone wants this is a good idea to put a cone out as a reference point to get to it, or are we better just working in the imaginary line? Tom, I, um, I think you're better off just using the imaginary line. Because look, there's always a line you got to get to. If anytime you do a one-on-one, -on -one, there's like a line through your guy to the goal. Or if they're shading you one way, then it's, it's, it's sort of past your guy to the middle or wherever you're trying to get to. But the idea, though, is I, I, I don't think so. I don't, I, I've tried it. I've thought about it. I've done it a bunch of different ways. I think this is the key. How would you handle 12 of you players that are new to the sport for this? Um, you know, look, I, 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 think, I think this is a – it's a one-on-one -on -one keep away. Have you guys ever – you know, think about playing like – it's just like playing soccer. If you're doing one-on-ones against your buddy in the backyard or your brother or something, and you like, you beat them, and then you turn back and you try to beat them again. Um, but but remember, this is like this is like backyard stuff. I would do this without a question if I had if I had a team I was coaching, because everybody has to learn how to control their man. That's what dodging truly is, in my opinion. It's your ability to control your man, to jab them and shift their weight to jab them and get them to step over, to, 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 to be able to stick your body and to step away, to pull them to you. So the biggest key is to get the defense to pressure and then get the offense to try to get back to the line and make it continuous. If there's defense, do these drills, should we use our pole? I wouldn't use poles, Rob. And this, I think you could eventually do that. I think it'd be a, I think it'd be a fine drill with more advanced players. But I think you're much better off doing this with shorties. And it's one of the reasons why I actually really like doing it with no equipment. Because it really, it, it turns it into more basketball type of physicality. And it just focuses on the footwork and the feel for these things. Uh, do I ever draw the line? Well, Augustus, I, I, sometimes I'll, I, I, I draw the line more. I, I use a line that's on the field sometimes to show them what I want and what I mean. But, but in the end, it's just not that hard to understand what you're trying to do, especially if you use some film. Um, so, okay, we'll go back to it. Second environment. All right, guys, so one-on-one -on -one plus a picker. One-on-one -on -one plus a picker is an awesome drill that can be done at home in the backyard and it can be done at practice. I do it all the time in men's cross, women's cross. Obviously it focuses on the no switch scenario, which, you know, look, they're going to switch sometimes, but, but this, this is an amazing drill for both sides of the ball, actually. Because the, the fact is in men's cross, they don't want to switch long, long to short, short to long. They don't want to switch a short stick on your best ball. They're going to, you're going to have to learn how to not switch. And when you don't switch, you can go, you can go under the pick or over the pick. And so if the D goes under the pick, you're looking to shoot or you're looking to slow down on the dodge so that the picker can adjust the pick to make the D run farther around it to be able to give you a, a, an advantage to the middle or to work to the goal. Um, and if the D goes over the pick, then you can invite them over like Luka Doncic was doing in the hostage dribble scenario, putting them on your back. Or if they really overplay you, you can refuse the pick. Or you can do what I was showing you guys that Dane Doby was doing, which is that you can let them uh, over and then roll back and use the pick on a rollback. So there's all kinds of ways that you can take advantage. And, and, and this is why it's repetition without repetition. 
the biggest mistake you can make in teaching two man game is to do two VO two man game. Biggest waste of time of all time. The entire point of two man game is to read, and we are isolating here the no switch read. The other thing is is that so the offensive task here is to score a goal and to make the right read. So what, I, what I'm really not that interested in seeing guys do every time is just run full speed, shoulder to shoulder off the pick and have the defender go underneath it and meet them on the other side. What I want them to do is to recognize if the defender is coming out on them or going under and to use the proper solution to that situation, which is going to involve slowing down. It's going to involve deception and hesitations and the threat of refusing the pick and not even using the pick. Now, the defensive task in this drill, this is very hard for the defense, guys. In fact, if this drill doesn't make you believe that you should be setting picks a lot more often, I don't know what will, because it is really, really, really hard for a defender to play one-on-one -on -one defense when there's basically a person in their way blocking them. It's really hard. And so, but it's great practice because we just don't want to switch a lot. It's almost like the defense is playing one-on-one -on -one defense, but trying to dodge a pick all at the same time. The kids that aren't very good at it, just let themselves get picked off. They're predictable. It's easy to see it. The kids that are a little bit better, you know, can jump out on you or quickly adjust and get under it or even fake it. They can, they can sell that they're getting out and go under. They can sell that they're going under early and get out, make the picker mix it up. So important for the picker to learn pick placement. Picker's learning how to set the pick about three or four yards away from the dodge so that he has time to adjust. And he's reading, the picker's reading the defense, the on-ball defense. Are they pushing out with a cross check or are they turning their head to figure out how to get underneath the pick? That, that'll tell you what to do. And the Dodger has to read it too and they work together on this. And it's truly one of the best ways to learn hesitations and hitches. This was quarantine. We don't even have a going in it because I was filming. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing a Dodger that's reading and the picker that keeps adjusting and the girl with the ball is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, reading this, using hesitations and fakes and the picker keeps adjusting and the defender sometimes goes out, sometimes goes over and they, gets, they get a shot off. Being able to read it like this. Look at those hitches right there, you guys. This is what I was talking about. This is so good. I'm going to watch Chad Palumbo at Princeton right now. But this defender's going under the pick, and he slows down, and he makes him come back, and the picker resets it. And now he's slowing down again, and the picker resets again. And now there's a hitch and a hitch. And look, look at the multiple hitches and what it does to the defender. So cool. These fakes and hitches, it forced the defender to reach. And then all of a sudden, he's right in. Ah, just a nice little easy uh, near side around the world. Picker adjusts. Here, the Dodger invites his player over to the pick. The def defender is pushing out, a little hesitation move. He puts him in a trail position. The one thing I want to sort of talk to you guys about, though, the one thing you, you just don't really want to see in this drill, honestly, is where the Dodger, the Dodger goes off the pick such that the picker runs into the pick too much because there would just be a switch here. What the Dodger needs to do is, is successfully bring his man with him, which would require more hesitations. We can also work on, oh yeah, check this out. This is like almost the exact same scenario we were just watching. This is Austin Stotts from a couple of years ago, the 2020 uh, summer bubble. By the way, check out the stomp move where he steps on the guy's foot. 
But now he gets into hitch and kind of like what we watched on the last one. Hitch, hitch, hitch. The defender reaches on that side. He reaches on that side. Hitch, hitch, hitch. These environments elicit the emergence of these types of skills. You won't get them when you're just running full speed with a lot of space. Really good example of, of the, a defender pushing over and a great refusal. Great, great hesitation and go. Watch how the Dodger has he's right here. He's sort of floating off the ground, bursts, rolls back. Knowing that the defender is, is looking to push out on him, and he uses it against them, and he falls down on the other side of the on the other side of the pick. This is at our epic uh, yearly Delray trip, family and friends beach and lacrosse vacation. Um, and you're going to see a bunch of examples. I just clipped out a bunch of examples of where the Dodgers were learning how, when they knew the defender wanted to pressure, they were using various refusals, refusing picks. Georgetown practice us here. Refuse the pick, come back, follow it down, come over the pick, no switch. These are all the things that you're going to be able to learn. Refuse the pick, follow it down, come back and use it. No switch. This is these are the things that happen in this. All right, we'll go back to the questions and answers. You guys, I can't stress enough the importance of one-on-one -on -one plus a picker. All right, great info and in getting my head to the question. More emphasis on these concepts in men's across and women's across thoughts? No, um, I don't think so at all. Um, I've got tons of women's clips that I'm going to share with you too, and uh, I think they're they are uh, there, there's 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 slight differences, of course, in the rules, but developmentally, it's exactly the same. I have learned a tremendous amount about men's across from coaching women's across. And I've learned a tremendous amount about coaching women's across from coaching men's across. I've got two daughters and a son. So I've coached, I've coached high school boys and high school girls and pro men's and college men's. And, you know, all these games are very, very similar. All right. So let's see. The other key to starting with one V one or even tag is to train your nervous system to allow you to, orient the stick and keep it protected while changing speed and direction without having to think about it. You have to be able to move freely while using your vision and feel and read and anticipate moving around with the ball and your stick should be as natural as carrying the ball in your hand. This is why players slow down and stop under pressure. Yeah, Bill. Well, that's a good point because I mean, basically in the most, you know, from the guy that was like, Hey, would this be good for the U 12? I mean, at the end of the day, you're just learning how to make moves and beat your man with the ball in your stick. You know, frankly, the way I would probably do this drill, um, back to the question about the U12 from uh, Dominic, is, is, is I, might, I might do it where you're doing this drill, you know, with like flags, you know, like I, I'll, I'll do it where I sort of take um, your penny and tuck it in your shorts and, and have it be a dodging drill with the ball in your stick, whether you're not going to get checked or stripped and you're really focusing on the, the movement and the read and the feel where the defender is going to have to like pull your jersey out of your shorts. So that's kind of how I would do that. Um from Will Van Dorn in this drill, the picker continuously repicks. Yes, that's correct. And, 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 you know, like you have to kind of figure out a little bit of a limitation on the moving picks. Um, you know, girls across, there's a blind pick and a block, but you actually are allowed to move a little bit more than in men's across. Men's across, you're really not. So what, that's why I'm trying to get people to like set their picks a little farther away. If you set your pick like three or four yards away, you have the opportunity to move and adjust your pick without setting a moving pick. If you set it too close, you will either miss or move. And then on the repicks piece, you know, when the defender goes under, the defender can slide in and, and eventually you're getting closer and closer. From Albi, would you have this drill go from four corners and maybe two points going at the same time to get more players moving? Or do you want to see all the space? Or, uh, you know, look, I think 
I think there's lots of different ways to do it. I mean, you know, you saw us do it in the street. You saw us do it on a field. I generally do it from the wing. And, um, you know, as far as all the space goes, what we're really trying to do is if the defender goes under the pick, we're trying to like reset the pick and, and, and get close enough to shoot if they keep going under. Um, and if they finally come over, then we're going to bait them over and we're going to bring them over. So you can definitely use a space constraint if you wanted to, but realistically, we're just sort of attacking from the wing like we might do in a regular game. Maybe we're going to get more reps than you would get in a game. You might not reset a pick like four times in a game, but you definitely see people resetting picks. Um, and it's a really important skill to be able to understand how to do that. So um, I think, um, yeah. All right, let's go to the next drill here. By the way, all of the, the control that I was talking about, the control in your area 1v1s, the control, the jabs, the hezzies, the, the pop-outs, the bring them out to you, the invite them to you, bait them to you, and all the hitches, they all, they're, they're all happening now in the context of two-man game. And it's so much easier to do it when you have two man game. You know, the one thing I didn't mention that I need to, I need to make sure is really clear right now. Didn't put in the slide, I should have, but I'm going to talk about it. In this one-on-one -on -one plus a picker and in any two man game, your basic advantage as the dodger or the cutter, if it's off ball, is that your defender cannot equally guard you towards the goal and towards the pick. And that, that very first clip where I showed Jeff T looking like he was going to use the pick and then going the other direction was the perfect example of that. Your, the understanding of how to use these two together, use the refusal, use the pick, go to the net, go to the pick, fake using the pick and refuse it, fake refusing it and coming back and using it. Every time you hesitate, it's a fake refusal. And you can keep everybody off guard. And it's, they, they, it's really, really hard to guard. And that's, that's, that's the most fundamentally important part of two-man game that everybody needs to understand. And most people don't because most people stare down what they're doing. That's why I said structure is the enemy of deception. And that's why I said the dumbest thing you can do is work on two-man game with no defense. Because what are you working on? coming off shoulder to shoulder, which never happens. You don't go shoulder to shoulder. You might do it if it's a shut off situation. But, but look, it's not happening. All right, uh, let's see here. So this was one of the, this game D squared, P squared is simply one-on-one -on -one plus a picker and a feeder. The task is very similar. So score a goal while reading if the D is going under or over. But now it turns it into an off ball and an on ball drill we, game. We did this in quarantine. My kids loved it. It was their favorite game. The only rule for the offense is that you have to make at least one pass to the feeder. And the defense rules is you're trying not to get picked off. And also in both of these, I, I want the defense to give us different looks. Don't just keep going under, 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 and just giving up a shot. Eventually go over the pick. And don't go over the pick on the first time every time so you get picked off and they just walk all the way in on a cut or a dodge. Let's make it hard for them. So, so here, this is, this is pretty good. You're, you're seeing here that – oops, darn it. You see how the, the dodger here off ball is trying to bait his man. He steps out. It would have been a little better if the picker had been in a better spot. The picker is not really doing a great job. The picker should have been picking right now for the for his pop out. You see that? That's like a flare pick. But he's not, he's not experienced with it yet. Um, the dodger is doing a really good job of baiting the – watch how the dodger is like – Baiting, hesitating, that's the punch hesitation move, and baits him over, and then he's able to kind of walk in. Sometimes we put the feeders, I don't know if we did it in this game or not. Sometimes we end up, we end up having the feeders on both sides, uh, on the same side in there. Watch this, this is a really good example here in girls lacrosse, women's lacrosse. 
watch how the Dodger is trying to bait the defender to come to her. She's trying to do that so she can get the easy give and go. But the defender's not taking the bait. She's going underneath. So the Dodger gives the ball up and now comes over. Notice this. This is so important, you guys. It's so important that the Dodger and the cutter, in this case, doesn't stare at the ball. The biggest problem that most people have off ball is they just stare at the ball and cut, and the defender meets them right on the other side, and they're not open. And they just jam things up. Watch how this how this cutter is reading the off ball situation, and then finally baiting the girl to come play her so she can be open over the top. So that was that was just too easy on the, on the side of the defense. This guy it gets a little bit better here as she starts getting under the pick, and I, I really like what the Dodger did. The, the uh, the offensive player here backpedals on like a flare. The picker could have done a little better job, I think, on this, but not bad. It's not bad. Step back. This is like our, do you see how this is, this turns into, it looks just like area 1v1s, doesn't it? Look at this. We start in a post up, we rock her, step back. And now we're, we're trying to get this, this, this picker should be looking to set a pick right now for the girl coming back. And great read on the give and go here. Do you see that? Watch this. She might have overdone it. Remember, I was saying before, I don't love it when you pick some when, when the girl on, on defense or the player on defense gets picked off so badly that they're running into the pick. It's not ideal because there's going to be a switch in that situation. We'll talk about switches in the next drill. Great step back. Pretty good. Watch this, watch this play. This is a, an athlete I work with. Um, and watch the off ball action here. This is so good. Look at that. You guys, look at that. All right, so the action is this. There's a seal right there. There's a seal right here. And this player, this is just like D squared, P squared. This is the no switch situation occurring on a seal on the backside, the righties. Watch how this player baits his man over the pick and then curls. Oh, and the, the silky behind the back feed. This is a team coached by my boy, Matt Rowley, Nobles and Greeno. A couple of Princeton guys right here, Chad Palumbo on the feed. Brody Upton on the uh, on the cut, but, but this is the stuff we've been working on. This is this is where the game is going, guys. There's so many opportunities for this, but that is exactly that's d squared p squared right there. That's the same bait them over the top that we saw right here. It's really the same idea. Bait your man over. Just imagine that this that five was sealing somebody and this other girl stepped up. That's the look. This is girls across again, high school team that I coached. Watch this. This was a, a watch this girl right here. Her man goes under the pick. So she backdoors it. Oh, I can't believe she dropped the pass. Watch another look. This is D squared P squared again. There's the girl. She's being face guarded. One of the best ways to practice this, but she's just slowly coming off the pick. The girl goes under it and she ends up wide open. Now oh, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, let's go to this one last clip. This is such a cool clip, guys. So watch the seal right here. By the way, we're down one goal with like a minute or two left in the uh, quarterfinals state tournament. So there's a seal right here. There's the seal. There is the girl being face guarded. There's the defender on her. Uh, the ball is over, going over to the to the right, left side. Watch how the girl brings her man over the pick and cuts. That's D squared, P squared. That's the exact same thing we've been watching. 
this is how you read the defense. And watch how she's watching her man. Knows that she's going to be there. All right. We got one more drill environment to share. Oh, it's 10 o'clock. Got one more drill environment to share. Two on two plus a feeder. Coverage, coverages and solutions. We're looking to create advantages, which is basically a two on one or a positional advantage. The on ball is exactly the same as the off ball. We need to move the ball and we need to use deception. So let's take a look at the switch situation first. Notice here how Austin Stotts has both defenders engaged in this two-man game. It's a switch situation. When we talk about getting two players on us, it's right here. That's the, that's the Dodgers man. That's the switch. What most people do is they just run right into the switch and the picker runs right into the on ball. And, and, and it's almost like most of the time, you guys, the offense does the switch for the defense. Defense stands there and the offense runs right into them. So this is the situation that everybody has to read. So look, the defense has to cover you. They have to cover the two-man game. I know this is very obvious, but they have to cover the two-man game. And so therefore, what we're going to do is be able to read it. If they switch, there's a solution. If they stay and go under, there's a solution. If they stay and go over, there's a solution. The biggest key for us is to be able to read it. So now this two-on-two -two plus a feeder, look, if you can do this, if you can get your kids to have five buddies and dad hop and net, you can play a two-on-two -two plus a feeder. Even if you don't have a goalie, you can, dad can be the feeder. Get two-on-two -two plus a feeder. I can't stress enough the power of this environment. You can literally learn everything you need to learn about the game in this. And this last sequence is really, really cool. So let's go ahead and watch this. He engages two. And Zach Beer ends up wide open on the backside. Now think about the deception here. His posture is selling that he's going underneath. That engages the low defender. Now he winds up and it engages his own man, and he engages the goalie, and he's able to put it right across. That last Jesse King opportunity. Watch this play. This is uh, Dane Doby again. This guy's so brilliant. Watch how he gets the ball over here. It's the defense is trying to switch. The picker is leaving. And Dobie just reads it and goes to the net. So, you know, guys, I want to make something really clear. Anytime there's a switch, there's going to be a defender on each side of a picker. When the picker exits the situation, if nobody guards him, obviously you feed it. That's what happened with Austin Stotts last time. But in this case, the low guy went with him, so Dolby had the underneath. Just like if the high guy had gone with him, Dolby would have gone top side. And, and so there, there's options everywhere you look. There are solutions everywhere you look. This play. She engages her man. She engages the switch. She comes back to her man. Now she's got both players. This is how you get a two-on-one. This is the advantage we're talking about. Remember, you can create an advantage by getting two-on-one, or you can create a positional advantage through an approach or, or through the, the switch itself. Now she throws it to the feeder, and we got a nation's look. Montgomery and company down by three. Two-pass pick and roll is the nation's look. When you set picks, anytime you set a pick and they switch, whoops. Montgomery and company. Anytime you set a pick and they switch, for a moment, there's two on the ball. These guys, that was a pretty poor switch, so it was more like a double. Um, but you can see how it left the picker open. Here's another so example from open. PLL. Watch this again. There's a pick. Pick for the ball, 44 step, 
nine, uh, 44 steps up. And this was not even a, a two on one. It was just a positional advantage due to the pick itself. Pounds built a steal. If they go under, we just shoot. Runs through check. If they go under, we shoot. If they switch, we hang them up and slip to the net and get a two on one. When they go under, we shoot. When they go under, we've got a positional advantage as well. In women's lacrosse, if they go under the pick and you've got the positional advantage, you don't just necessarily rip it, but they got it all the way to the net. Watch here on this next clip. Same thing, exactly. The girl's going under and she waits, 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 waits and then goes in and shoots. And so you, it's about reading the defense, guys. And this is exactly the same. That's the one-on-one -on -one plus the picker for the person who just asked. What if they go over the pick? This is the biggest cheat code in the game. It's called inviting your man over the pick. Right here, Brandau's got a straight line to the goal, and the pen guy has to go around the pick. He could go under it, but he's not going under it. A lot of people don't go under because they want to go over because they're saying to themselves, we're not, I'm not going, you know, we don't want to go under picks. We don't want to give up shots. We don't want to turn our head. We want ball pressure. We're going to switch if we have to. If we run into the pick, we'll switch. That's what the defensive coordinators are saying. But but when Brando gets to here and his man's to here, he's got a straight line. This guy's never going to catch him. That's how Luka Doncic kept putting guys on his back with this hostage dribble concept. This creates either a two-on-one or a one-on-o. -on In this case, it's a one-on-o. -on Here's Jeff Teat doing it, looking it off. Look at, look at him using his advantage of looking off the pick, looking off the pick, makes the move. This is the, the biggest thing that you guys have to realize is that you don't go shoulder to shoulder. You take, if they're going over the pick, you invite them over the pick. Right now, Jeff Teach got a straight line and the defender has to go around it. The defender will never catch up. It's not going to be possible. Watch this clip again and watch how wide Brando takes him to bait him over the pick. He's baiting him over. He's not going shoulder to shoulder. He's giving him some daylight. Same with Teach. Give him some daylight. Look it off. Bounce, bounce, bounce. Look it off. Turn the corner. You guys, one of the nuances is so important. I tell you about setting picks far enough away. The other thing is don't wait for the pick to be set to make your move. Last year, ASU game winner against Rutgers. 35 to shoot. Watch the, watch the two-man games and the Adams. slips that they're using here. Adam slips, bounces it in. Just That's phenomenal across that they played. Here, no switch. Jake Byrne invites him over the top. Here, we're working on it from the girls across. Hostage dribble, invite him over the top. These are kids that have been doing this stuff. This is how you learn how to do this. In this game, this is what you want to learn how to do it. It's right here. This game, right here, two on two plus a feeder. Watch what the girl's doing. She's engaging two defenders right now. She's got both of them engaged. She knows it. And she gives it up early so that she can try to get the picker open. And then both guys go with the picker. So she has the advantage on the cut. That's the positional advantage that she got. Engaged. Now, this is off ball. Check this out, you guys. Off ball. It's, she doesn't have the ball. It looks like she has a ball. It's exactly the same. She engaged both defenders with her positioning, opening up the slip right through the middle. Off ball is the same as on ball. This is perception and action coupling. And this is what we're trying to get everyone to understand that they can work on and what they can master. Watch how she's delaying the release of this, trying to get both players on her to get the picker open. There he is, the picker's open, and she's open on the give and go. Two on two plus a feeder teaches you every element of the game. I can't stress enough the importance of two on two plus a feeder. Seal, bump. It's just like area 1v1, step back, punch move, move it, seal, pick, slip. Ball comes back over it. Read it. Oh, she can see there's a switch. How does she know there's a switch? Well, 
because when she started to come over, she noticed her man's looking away, dropping off, and she notices the other girl is switching over. So she comes back to her own man. They both go with the slip, and she's wide open. That happens all the time, you guys. The PLL was using a lot more off-ball two-man actions, I noticed, this year. When one person switches and one person stays, it creates a two-on-one. So here's a pick, cut. The guy, I don't know. He, he was, he was, it was this this defender. The pole was playing like almost like the the hedge defense that you do on ball, where they go under the pick and you hedge and you give it a step out and whack it. The, the defender on ball is off the, on the cutter is going under. The defender steps out and then gives it back to him, but then he thinks he's switching. One person switched and one person stayed wide open in front of the net. Off ball pick slip. It's even easier when there's the action when the, there's a potential slider. Gives you an outside presence with the left hand. Rapist. Look at this action on the backside. This is where the game's going, in my opinion. The the off ball action. Watch um this little bee sting pick here from left hand from thirty three. One person switches, one person stays. Whoops. Gives you an outside presence. And thirty three is wide open underneath. Off ball here on the hang up. Simple refusal. This is the, the amazing thing about off ball two man, you guys, is that it's exactly the same as on ball. He's pretending he's using the pick. He's looking it off, and he's wide open. Watch the uh, the second clip here. Watch how he's looking this off. Right here. Watch how the offensive player, Canadian kid, sees that he knows he's going to get the ball, so he looks away from it now. Looks away, looks away, looks away, refuses the pick. Messenger. This little play right here where T gives it up, gets it back, gives it up, pick, uses it, gets it back. How did the defense play that? They stayed. They put it, he was in a permanently trailing position. Just gets chipped. He's got the step. He can't catch up. He'll never catch up. It's exactly the same read that we saw with Luka Doncic. The reads off ball are the same as they are on ball. This is a sick play right here. There's a seal. Watch the seal down right there. The girl comes off of it. Three girls got picked off on that one. Here's another one. Really cool off-ball play. This is a give and go. Right there, she's inviting her man over the pick. She's got the straight line of the net. The girl's running around it. I mean, how good is that? This is the exact same stuff that we're talking about. This is what this is the whole game. That's D squared, P squared right there, but it's in a it's in a two on two plus a feeder situation. You know, you can do your two on two plus a feeder with your feeder on the same side. Think about this two on two plus a feeder, like the drill we talk about, but it can be same side feeder and it works on your sort of nations and, and rattle cuts. The movement, this is ASU again. Man, the movement that uh, Tim McCormick got with his ASU his ASU squad was just off the charts, the way they pass the ball, the way they pick for each other, the way they move without the ball. It's just absolute thing of beauty. Here we had Mama feeding. It's the last clip I'm going to show you, but what we were working on was an off-ball two-on-two drill. And what I was trying to do was engage two defenders off ball to open up the slip. Check this out too. I pretended it wasn't coming. Caught it. My daughter actually didn't realize the ball was in the air and I caught it. She doesn't even know I have it. The deception that you can use off ball right there with my posture, I'm trying to engage the switch by selling receive. I'm trying to engage both defenders and I do. I sold receive. Think about this. It's like selling pass if you have the ball. I'm selling receive to engage defenders. So in the T squared, P squared, we're working on all of the no switch scenarios. And when we're in our two on two stuff, we've got the ability to work on switches. And our goals are to engage defenders. 
All right, everybody. That's that's the presentation. I know I lost a lot of you guys because it's getting late. I knew this one might go long. But you guys, um, these four environments, area 1v1s, one-on-one -on -one plus a picker, add the feeder to your one-on-one -on -one plus the picker, and that's D squared, P squared, because it stands for Dodger, Defender, Picker, Passer. And then add another player so you can have a two-on-two -two plus a feeder where you can begin to work on the switch reads. You guys, the whole game is your ability to control your man so that in, 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 in bait your man and jab your man and feel it so that you can then use a pick and figure out the switch and read all this stuff and use all the deception, looking off the pick, looking, all of that stuff comes together. You keep hammering that stuff and you're going to have, you saw there's a bunch of kids that are re really reading out there. Those ASU girls, all the kids that play a lot of free play, they're really reading stuff. That's perception and action couple. You master this stuff, I guarantee you, you're going to be able to play for somebody. Guarantee it. And you know what? Nobody's doing this. And I bet I do this whole webinar and nobody goes out and does it too. But anyways, let's um, let's answer some questions here. Um, let's see. I bought your backyard series and it's excellent. John Lanoza has some great basketball videos and webinars on the two-man game and off ball and lots of drills showing how he teaches it. Many transfer to Lax directly as a coach. It's just fun to watch Lax and B-ball. Yes, I agree. Um, Dominic said, excellent. Thank you. Whitney Hayden said, thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Whitney. Um, and Augustus Stagger. Thanks, Jamie. Great stuff. All right, everybody. Hey, have a great night. Thank you so much. Um, shoot me an email if you got questions. And that was a lot of fun. Bye.